Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Welcome to our, our uh, event tonight. I'm Steve Sapienza, a senior editor at the Pulitzer Center. Thank you for being with us. While we're waiting for people to join, um, if you don't mind, um, please uh, let us know in the chat where you're joining us uh, from today. In a few moments, we'll have, um, uh, we'll, we'll have an in-depth conversation about the documentary film Beneath the Polar Sun. If you're joining us without having watched the film, not to worry. There are a couple ways you can still see the film after, after this event. Uh, you can watch a streaming version of it on, uh, with the PBS app. Um, or you can go to uh, pbs.org via the link that we're going to put in the chat, and you can uh, watch it there. Also, if you live in the U.S., uh, please check your local PBS station website for broadcast uh, airtimes uh, this month, uh, where you, you might be able to catch the film in your area. Uh, either way, I highly recommend checking out this incredibly gripping and timely film. Uh, it really drives home what's at stake uh, if we continue to ignore what is happening in the high Arctic. Uh, if you haven't joined us before, the Pulitzer Center is a nonprofit journalism and educational organization. We're dedicated to raising awareness of underreported global issues. Last year, we supported 275 reporting projects in collaboration with journalists, filmmakers, and news outlets all over the world. We also work with classrooms and communities to extend the impact of journalism and cultivate public engagement with these issues globally. You can learn more about our work uh, in our 2022 annual report, and I think we're going to share that uh, report also in the chat. Over the years, the Pulitzer Center has uh, supported numerous reporting projects about the changing Arctic, the changing way of life for its indigenous peoples, and the science that is helping us understand the dramatic ongoing changes there. Since 2020, uh, we have uh, further emphasized our commitment uh, to raising the visibility of underreported stories from the Arctic with support of the Arctic Reporting Fund. We are enabling um, by uh, both uh, indigenous journalists and other reporters around the Arctic um, to, uh, to report on it. Uh, and we are partnering with filmmakers, journalists, and educators to hold events such as this one to emphasize the vibrance of Arctic communities and to address the environmental and scientific urgency of a changing Arctic climate. On that note, I'd like to uh, introduce our fellow, our, our moderator for tonight. Please meet uh, the Pulitzer Center's 2023 Persephone Meal Fellow, Miral Jamal. She is an Indian national who grew up in the UAE, returned to India for high school, and went to Canada for college. In Canada, she became interested in the Arctic, the culture of its indigenous people, and the impact that, the, that global warming is having on the Arctic's climate and the effect that that is having on the rest of the world. Miral is currently a reporter for the Nunatsiak News in Iqaluit, which is an, on the northern edge of the Hudson Bay in Nunavut. She is currently reporting out a series of stories uh, with our support about the first ever Arctic Snow School, which you can read uh, also via a link that we're gonna put in the chat. Now, um, before I turn it over to Meral and our guests, I uh, have a few tips for our audience for the conversation in the Q&A. Uh, you'll see a Q&A icon on your screen, and you can begin adding your questions for our speakers at any time throughout the discussion. There's also a chat icon on your screen, and we'd appreciate it if you use the chat box for uh, specific uh, tech issues. We want to let you know that we are recording this session and we will publish it on the Pulitzer Center website after the conversation. And one other note, please stay a bit longer after the session ends and participate in a brief survey. And now without further delay, I'll hand it off to Meral and uh, from the documentary, Polar, Oceanog uh, Polar Oceanographer Chris Horvat and filmmaker Stephen Smith. Take it away, Meral. Thank you so much, Steve. And Stephen and Chris, it's nice to meet you guys. Stephen, we met just two days ago virtually. And Chris, it's nice to virtually meet you. Um, and thank you so much to the both of you for being here. I want to just start by asking you, can you tell me more about yourselves and just how you came to make the Beneath the Polar Sun documentary together? Carl, Steve, you can start on that one. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. So, um, well, my name is Stephen Smith, and um, I have been involved in uh, work in the Arctic 
for the last four decades or so. I started out as a wildlife biologist working on seabirds in the far north. And um, over the last number of decades, was watching the Arctic change and change dramatically. And so at some point about 15 years ago, I started um, making feature films uh, about the changing Arctic and to try to, to kind of draw some attention to what was going on in the far north and try to make it relevant. Um, so this particular project um, represents a third feature film on Arctic change for me. Yeah, so, uh, so I'm actually coming to you from New Zealand. So I'm a professor at Brown University in the States, but I'm also a lecturer here in, in Auckland University. And uh, yeah, so I, I work on trying to understand and model polar change um, from a climate modeling perspective, sort of integrating observations and, and also um, some satellite and, and modeling work. So my background is actually as a mathematician, which explains a lot of the reasons why during the film I was complaining a lot because this was one of my first exposures to real in-depth um, field work. And the way that Steve and I met was, I think, somewhat fortuitously that Steve and Diana, who's a co-producer on the film, just attended a talk that I gave once in graduate school. And I guess they liked me because they asked me if they if there were any specific scientific questions we could ask in regions like Nair Strait, which is where we filmed uh, the, the film. And I essentially told them, I'll tell you if you bring me with you. <laughs> and I, I think I was quite persistent in, in doing that, mainly because I, I really saw the value in actually being able to touch the sort of things that I was studying. So I think that's how this all got kicked off. And I just came along for the ride, essentially. Yeah, Chris was actually at a, a workshop at uh, Woods Hole. And for Diana and I, my wife and I, you know, Chris gave the only or one of the only talks that we could understand. It was mostly high math and physics, and it was pretty out there. But Chris gave a talk that was very intriguing, and and uh, it was all about sea ice. And, and of course, that's the theme of our project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And I will come back to just how do we make the science behind um, climate change and the climate crisis and the Arctic in a larger sense more accessible in a bit. Um, but I wanted to actually go back to the before times for the both of you from this documentary, before the pandemic, basically before Zoom and all the rest of it, I want to go back to your childhoods and just start by asking how and what did you first learn about the Arctic? Wow. Well, as a Canadian, I'll just jump in short briefly here, Chris. Um, for, for me, as a Canadian, you know, the North is part of 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 well it's part of our national identity i suppose you know and um so i'd heard about the north and my father had worked in the north doing field work as a geologist so so i did i did know about this but actually my first experiences in the north were as an alpinist i i was very keen on climbing the mountains that are in the in the far north of the yukon and um so we went on some expeditions there as a as a teenager actually um, and um, and then, you know, my father questioned the wisdom of going out on the, all of these expeditions in the far north and what, what are you doing this for and what, where is it going to take you and how are you going to get a job and all that. And of course, my first the first job that I got as a biologist was I, I Canadian Wildlife Service was looking for climbing biologists to work on Arctic cliff nesting seabirds. So that became a, a big part of my life for for about 15 years or so. Yeah, for me, I think there's less of an interesting childhood story around it. I think I kind of fell backwards into studying the Arctic. Um, I, as a child, it was kind of revealed to me that um, I always wanted to be an oceanographer, I guess, but I think I was more inspired by people like Jacques Cousteau and diving. I'm terrified of the open ocean, so that never became really an option. So I think as I moved into graduate study, I was more intrigued by understanding things in remote places like the Arctic, where there's lots of change and Kind of an unstudied problem 
um, at least from the general perspective of, of um, climate science. It's areas that are very remote to us in North America or in, here in Aotearoa. And I think, yeah, there's just an appeal from sort of a philosophical, philosophical perspective um, studying you know, far-flung places and, and the change that's occurring there. So I think for me, it was really a draw to an interesting scientific problem at first, and then it became, you know, a love of being in the Arctic and Antarctica as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, you know, it's interesting, like, I asked this question because I think each of us has our own first experience with the Arctic, even before it's physical, there's that intellectual and personal story that we've heard about a region so far away. But the both of you actually went to arguably the northernmost part of the northernmost part of the world. Um, and I wanted to actually just ask you, you know, what was what was going on behind the scenes? You know, why this expedition? And what were really your hopes um, for, for the work that would happen when, when you'd make it to Nara Strait? I guess I should take that one to begin with, Chris. Um, so, you know, for, for me, uh, telling trying to tell the story of a changing Arctic, you know, how do you do that? And um, so we looked at, my first feature film was looking at at essentially what, what it means to be a bird, uh, one of these cliff nesting birds and trying to make your way in a changing Arctic. And then and then the second feature film was, well, what does it mean to to be an indigenous person from from the, the northern tip of of Greenland and Canada, you know, making your life in in a changing Arctic. And um, and then I just realized that you know, forty years had gone by, and and actually, I'd been watching this changing Arctic, and I really felt like, you know, we can talk about the birds, and we can talk about the residents, the people that live there. And somehow it's just a distant land. It's a distant problem, distant change. You know, really, how do you make it relevant to a Southern audience? You know, because it really is very relevant to Southern audiences. But how do we do that? How do we communicate that? You know, so uh, that was my quest. I really wanted to find a way to, to try to communicate about the fact that that the Arctic is changing at this absolutely unbelievable rate. And... And what what does that mean, and how can we bring that home, make it make it you know relevant to people in the south? And um, so the choice of location. This is the last ice area. You know this place that was called was dubbed the last ice area. This is going to be the place where the last of the world's sea ice was going to you know, or at least the thickest and the and the oldest ice was going to persist the longest. And um, so there's something alluring about about that. And also, you know, no one lives there. There there are no local residents. There's no connection to a local community in that part of the world. And so, uh, you know, that's it's a little easier maybe to tell the story from the perspective of science when when it's um, when when we don't have the the local um, story and it's not about the wildlife so much it's it's a this story about what's actually changing in in the in the oceanography of the region yeah i i think i sort of echo what what steve is saying about telling you know having a narrative behind at least the people and the place and i think from in science even though there is this element of science which is sort of unchanging and doesn't depend on the observer the there is a, a real need to translate some of the scientific concepts we understand to both a lay audience, folks who might want to watch the film, but also for me to the community of scientists I engage with on a day to day basis. And I think there's a sense of not, you know, scientists are people too. And folks who study sea ice and, and go to the Arctic or try to understand changes in the Arctic also see the Arctic as a remote and distant place. And for me, that was certainly true. You know, I'd, I'd not spent any time actually on the ice myself. So there's an immense value from a, as, from a scientific perspective and actually being in a place that you're studying. And, and it's very challenging to do that. So a big part of, you know, the initial efforts for me and the planning for me was being able to 
at least give myself some mental credibility that I knew what I was talking about and that I understood what was actually happening. And I think maybe we got a little bit too much of that. Um, I think we really did experience the both the inadequacies with our current understanding of how sea ice is evolving from a climate science perspective, and also the inadequate ways that we've dealt with the climate problem in general. So they're kind of almost linked in this case, whereas we wouldn't have said this was occurring if we looked at climate models, like we never would have gotten stuck if we used what we expect from climate model output. And we sort of bury our heads in the sand as North Americans and, and people in, in New Zealand in terms of whether this is actually occurring at all. So whether these dramatic changes are gonna have impactful results for, for everyone else. Mm -hmm. And Chris, I wanna follow up from that, you know, for both, um, well, I'm guessing the people who have had the chance to see this documentary probably have some sense of this, but for those that haven't, can you talk to me a bit more about the significance of um, the last ice area? and just the changes that we're seeing and how rapid they are um, on the ground. Yeah, so there's a conceptual idea behind this area of Nunavut or Northern Canada, or West Greenland, Northern, Northwest Greenland, that this is a place that for hundreds of years or maybe a hundred years, we'll still have thick permanent sea ice. And most of the Arctic used to always have or maybe half of the Arctic sea ice cover right now used to be comprised of this very thick ice that would make it through multiple freezing and melting cycles. What we found was none of this ice. We didn't actually experience very much of this permanent sea ice in the area where the permanent sea ice was meant to be. And that comes down to changes in the character of the ice upstream, so closer to the North Pole, and also just a fundamental maybe physical properties of the ice itself, that it's this fracturable, brittle medium. And that really ties into the work that we're doing, especially in my research group, and that inspired a lot of the work I did during my PhD and subsequently, which has to do with how sea ice is this fragmented, brittle material. And so the funny bit is when you actually ask yourself, where will the ice persist the longest? Well, we don't know for sure. We have to make climate model projections of the ice and its coverage in the future. And if those climate models are built assuming sea ice is a very thin sort of deformable plastic sheet, well, it'll stay in areas like Nair Strait for a long time because you've got coasts and whatever. But if you think of sea ice as what it actually is, which is this composite fractal material, it just flows right through Nair Strait when it gets thin enough. And it's been doing that for decades. And so it's kind of revealed that maybe this idea of a last ice area, at least as it comes to sea ice, is a bit of a yeah, it might not actually be that way at all. This ice is already gone in the way, in like sort of a meaningful way from how it was 40 years ago. Um, and we experienced that sort of firsthand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, for the both of you, I mean, there is this disconnect between how the Arctic is um, understood across the world and how the Arctic really is right now. Um, and I was wondering, you know, what was your expectation versus reality experience when you actually got there on a personal level? Um, what were you expecting before you got to Narrow Strait and once you actually got there? Well, I was lied to. Yes, Chris, go. <laughs> I was told that we were going on this expedition where we'd be in kayaks for about six weeks sound really cool we're going to do some you know, beluga whales and narwhal and beautiful things and sunny every day and that was what i was told <laughs> and that was very far removed from the experience we actually had and the reason it was not like that was because of climate change and because of poor projections of the state of sea ice in this region by climate models and a, a lack of scientific understanding I think in our community of scientists that study the Arctic as to what sea ice and polar climate is actually doing. So I think the those responses that we felt during the filming of this movie and that are on in the film itself are real. Like we really didn't expect things to go the way they went. And as with many scientific sort of realizations, you look back and you think, well, I should have known this. This is, you know, transparently the ice is different now. And 
I can look back now with that experience and say, well, now, what kind of idiot was I not realizing that the sea ice was different than we had expected it would be. But you never actually do that in the planning stage. That's why we do these kind of experiments. Um, let's call this an experiment. Um, so yeah, it was it was quite a bit different than we expected, and, and the reason were you know all of these different causes that I've outlined just before. Yeah, and I guess for for me it's uh, it's interesting because I I've, I've been touching on this area near a straight. Uh, first time I was there is in the early 1980s. So, you know, I, I've been going going back there, you know, year, not year after year, but often enough that you really see the change. And so that said, um, we, we were on a, another film project um, in the early 2000s, and we were, we were trying to tell the story of the, the ill-fated um, polar explorer Adolphus Greeley's expedition, and and so we we actually made a journey from the top end of Nair Strait down to where Adolphus Greeley had his last camp, and that took a summer, and it was very feasible. It was very challenging, and and the I told the executive producer of that project at the time, I said, you know, nothing has changed since Greeley's time. It's going to be just as tough for us as it was for Greeley from the standpoint of the ice conditions. And I think, you know, going over Greeley's records from the 1880s, it's it was true. Like, you know, the early 2000s um, looked a lot like the 1880s, according to what, what, what we read about anyway, and according to Greeley's experiences and our own experiences. So that was my my faux pas perhaps was you know going into the area with this idea that oh yeah well you know the arctic is changing and it's fastest changing place on earth but you know actually uh we'll still be able to do this thing because you know we know what we're doing and we'll still be able to navigate this strait and we'll get this work done that we want to do in the strait and 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 this will be great so the expectation was that we'd be able to actually you know that it would be feasible to to make a journey through this strait and do some surveys for ice along the way and the reality was as the film shows you know was very different it was a completely changed environment from the early 2000s yeah yeah that's very interesting just what a little over two decades can can do to what is such a large area of of the world and of the arctic in its own way i wanted to though ask you both what was the logistics and the planning phase like um you know you've talked about the physical challenges of actually being there and what happened when you were there but what was it like putting this all together and assuming parts of it was you know around the pandemic as well so just kind of getting all the components together and planning an expedition that was a, around five weeks. Well, you know, as you know, Meryl, uh, traveling around in Nunavut, and uh, you had you had your own experiences this past week and trying to get from community to community and missing planes and all of this stuff. So first of all, it's... Um, uh, there are limitations on on where you can go by commercial air travel. Um, turns out that we we could we could use Resolute Bay in Nunavut as a stepping off point because we could charter a, a, a turboprop aircraft there, a Twin Otter, and so um, we planned to get ourselves and all of our equipment to Resolute Bay, and then we would charter a plane, and then we would take that plane to this. To the coast of this last ice area and in fact we started our this journey right where Adolphus Greeley had uh left uh from it in northern right where his base of operations was in in on the north end of Ellesmere Island but you know that all sounds very straightforward you know you just charter a plane but none of it's straightforward um just just air travel to get from Ottawa to Resolute Bay is $10,000 each in terms of, of lowest economy airfares, you know? So 
fortunately, we were really we were supported by the airlines. Um, they 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 didn't give us seats, but they gave us deeply discounted seats, which we were so grateful for. We had local accommodation provided for us um, along the way as well, which was incredibly helpful. And then the Twin Otter flights, well, those are challenging because, you know, you have to have fuel, you know, you have to figure out where you're going to get fuel. And and so this was a another challenge is, you know, these planes have a limited range and we were flying one way, five or six hours, one way, one direction just to get from Resolute Bay to where we were going to put in to start this project. And all of this, I should point out, was, you know, um, we were unaffiliated with any other institutions. You know, normally, one goes to these places, if one goes to these places, especially to do some kind of scientific work, one, one goes up there under the aegis of, of some institution, because, first of all, it's just so expensive. And secondly, uh, it's kind of your insurance policy, right? But we didn't have that. And so um, that the, those scenes towards the end of the film where we're wondering about this plane, I mean, this plane had flown for five hours to try and come and pick us up. And it almost didn't land like it was that close. It almost didn't land. Each one of those flights, you know, would have, well, that that's a $50,000 flight, you know. So it's it was a it's a real out there experience trying to do a project like this and be unaffiliated um or independent would be a better way to to describe it and and um uh but we really felt very committed to to making this this project work so anyway i should let you comment on what you saw chris because you saw it from a, a little bit different perspective right I mean, from my side, I came from New Zealand and the flights from Ottawa to where we put in at, uh, yeah, at the old camp in Fort Conger. I think that was a longer journey than it took me to get from Wellington, New Zealand, where I was living to Ottawa. So distance wise, it's not that far, but certainly, you know, I'd never been in a twin otter plane before. I'd never had to pick up fuel in some random runway in the middle of nowhere where somebody had dropped a fuel drum years before um, and then refuel a plane and then go somewhere else. And that was quite a, an interesting experience. I mean, I didn't have to participate in much of the logistical planning, so I was lucky in that respect. Um, but certainly, yeah, it was an interesting process of getting things together. And I had equipment that I was bringing as well, which looked suspicious and had lots of Pyrex and weird things hanging out of it. And that got me in a lot of trouble at the Ottawa airport. Um, so it was fun. Uh, from my side, I think it was a bit more stressful from, from Steve and Diana's side. Yeah, there was a point in the documentary where Diana is talking about toilet paper. And that was um, that really was a reality check for someone who was just in Cambridge Bay and had no sense of what to pack while going there. I was very fortunate to be living at the Canadian High Arctic Research Station, but it is one of those things that you think about just how much you have to pack and, and how many details there are within that. Um, I wanted to ask you guys a bit more about communicating climate change. Um, and one of the things that really stood out to me about this documentary is just how accessible the language um, used within it was. I mean, when talking about um, sea ice and, and the loss of it, Diana uses the metaphor of, of basically wearing a white shirt um, on, on a warm day and, and how for the world, um, the ice is essentially that white shirt. And I wanted to know from you, Stephen, and, and from you, Chris, as well, you know, in this documentary, how did you go about thinking about making it accessible to everyone who may not just know, may not know enough about the Arctic, but may not know enough about sea ice and may not know enough about climate change and just the effect that it's having and is going to have moving forward? Should I start that one, Chris? Sure. Um, 
you know, I, very low expectations in terms of of the delivery of information in this film. I think the the first and foremost for us was the sense that, you know, there is a lot of information out there and typical science documentaries are delivering a lot of information. And what is the really important information that we want to get across? But more to the point, what's the viewer experience? You know, what, what do we want to leave people with? So I think for a project like this one, we're really lucky because um, that's one of the most stunning places in the world. You know, it's a visually very dramatic landscape. So first and foremost, you know, you want to leave an audience with this sense of awe and wonder about this incredible part of the world that maybe they didn't know anything about before, you know, so that was important. But then just a simple kind of message that the Arctic is changing. It's changing way faster than other places on Earth. And that matters. And why does that matter? So just to have the discourse in the film where where we could fish out flesh out those those elements of, of like why does this change matter why does it why should we be paying attention to this change you know and then if i if i was to strip strip all of that away for a second and just say there's so much conversation about how the world is warming up but we're not talking about well how do we cool the world down we're not well we are <laughs> We are talking about that, starting to get the it's starting to enter the conversation now. But just the idea that how would the world normally cool itself down? You know, and it's amazing to me um, in in conversations with with friends and family and giving you know Q and A's and presentations. How often um, that raises eyebrows? Like, wow! So how does the world? cool itself you know or, or i mean it's it makes it it's it's not the language of a scientist right but truly how does the world keep itself cool you know and so to leave those ideas floating around in in a in the 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 leftover visuals for the viewer you know that's that's all what we cared about mm -hmm. And I will yep. say as far as scripting, you know, Chris worked really hard with us to communicate these things in a way that was, that was, you know, in, in some ways, um, uh, I don't want to say simple, but just um, scientists talking in a way that's really accessible. Chris worked really hard on that. And we worked hard on our own language and our own communication to try to to bring it into that kind of place of of down to earth discourse. Yeah, I would just add that from a science communication perspective, I think the hardest thing to do is find natural ways of relating these kind of concepts to people. And I think not on purpose. I'm, I'm not sure what this film would have been like had the conditions remained the same as they were 20 years prior, but the, the experience we had almost speaks for itself. You know, I think it's apparent to anyone watching the film that the reason for the change that we experienced and the reason we had a difficult time in Nair Strait is related to changes to the sea ice, which are themselves related to climate change. And I think that's the essential story here that all the, you know, things we say in the film, as long as we don't bore people, don't matter because the the take home message from from sitting there for thirty minutes with us or an hour with us is that yeah things are different than we expected and we look like fools when we go to the Arctic and expect conditions to remain the same um, and I think part of the you know I think that Steve and Diana did a good job of trying to humanize at least I feel like I was humanized in in the movie because I needed more toilet paper and I whined about going camping and um, but I you know I I hope that that at least lets people know that these are, you know, we are just not robots. We're not like we had expectations. We weren't right. And the reason we weren't right was because the world is changing really rapidly. So I think um, 
yeah, hopefully it, it speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I kind of wanted to follow up on just the language that was used as well, because I found it uh, very interesting that you had the personal narrative within it as well. Uh, this is pretty different from where I come from in, in terms of journalism in that we treat ourselves and our work as, as that of being observers, um, of being objective, of seeing ourselves as separate from what we're covering or the story we're trying to tell. Uh, but you guys humanized climate change in a region so far away um, for most people and uh, you included your personal experiences within that. And I was wondering, you know, from that perspective, what is the value of seeing ourselves as part of the climate change story, uh, both within the Arctic and beyond it? Hmm. Yeah, I think this goes back to something I was saying before, which is that there are things that are true about Earth's climate. And there are facts. And there is a there are plenty of scientific studies that show us that the ice is declining or or, or the wor world is warming. But fundamentally, this is true not just publicly, like in film or 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 any other sort of media or journalism or something. You have to convert that information, those like units of knowledge or whatever, to a language that people can understand. And I think showing through doing is usually quite a way of a better way of teaching than just showing through talking. Um, so, yeah, I think that was a, a clearly valuable part of this was injecting our own story. I mean, I don't think any of, we didn't interpret the science. The science remains the science. Like we, the models are wrong in certain ways. The projections are wrong in certain ways. The climate is changing and the climate is forming. And none of that depends on whether we were there or not. Um, but certainly I think showing that human beings like normal folks from Rhode Island or Canada or, you know, people from North America who live quite far away from the Arctic. Um, you know, these facts that we find in the IPCC report have real impacts and would impact you if you went up there too. Um, and I think, unfortunately or fortunately, telling that story from a sort of Southern perspective is the way you reach people in the South. In the South, I mean, people that are not in Arctic Canada, um, making it a little bit come a little bit more close to home for folks who are watching the film from from my hometown or here in New Zealand. Yeah, that's a really good, really good point. Really good points, Chris. And um, you know, it's interesting too. There's a <laughs> there's a whole other dimension to the visuals that you know. There's a lot of there's a lot about the ice that's below the surface. So it's really hard also to get a sense of, of this thing, the sea ice. Like what, what exactly is the sea ice? What, what is this, this frozen ocean? And, and why, why is it important? And, and the other thing about it is like what, it, as it turns out, the reason why this ice persists or is thought to have persisted in in, the, in this so-called last ice area is is because there is supposed to be really really thick sea ice there and uh the really thick stuff is the stuff that's strong it's the stuff that used to be back in Greeley's day and back in earlier times when I was there it used to be in sheets that would be no kidding the size of Manhattan you know or bigger just a single ice flow you know was that big and um and these things now um, don't really exist. And how do you tell that story on, on the, you know, without actually getting on the ground, without actually experiencing the crush in the ice and seeing all the fragments and the bits and how things are moving. And, you know, some of those time-lapse images there, um, I don't think we ever did a time-lapse that was any longer than about an hour seriously in the entire film I think uh, all of those time lapses that are in the film were were in that ballpark of about an hour long you know at the most and so you just think of how fast that ice is moving in that hour 
like how much you know that ice is moving south right so anyway how do you convey all that and again getting down on the ground like chris was saying earlier getting down on the ground seeing it putting your hands on it so to speak and being stuck in it and i'm watching it grind by and realizing that that there you you wouldn't have a hope of 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 being able to withstand that onslaught of ice you know trying to navigate through it so those are all things you want to leave people with you know the sense of a dynamic environment that's uh that's just a bit otherworldly absolutely thank you so much for that i realize we have hit the um, 40 minute mark and we have a question from the audience so I'm just going to read it out and hopefully for all those who are listening, you have more questions because I certainly do and I'll be the one asking them. Um, so yeah, this is a question from uh, Raul. I might be pronouncing the name wrong. Sorry for that. Um, the question is, how can we become involved in this research? Um, slash environmental movement, especially as an anthropologist or filmmaker who wants to do research about the North American West and Northern Mexico droughts caused by climate change and by abuse of water resources. Yeah, maybe I can address this a little bit. So kia ora Raul. Um, I think it's important, especially if you are a filmmaker, and I think Steve did this very well. This is a little bit self-serving, but I think reaching out to the scientific community, involving them, a lot of like sort of, I'd say documentary films use talking head scientists. And that means somebody stands up and says, well, you know, in the Arctic, sea ice is declining fast. And here's a chart of the sea ice declining fast. And that's valuable. Folks need to know that. And that's important information. But I think if you're going to film scientists talking about their science and the impacts their science have on people, those people should be a part of the um, film itself. So they should be experiencing it as, as you would or as the subjects would. And I, I think that's a valuable part of this for me. It's changed the science that I do and it's changed my ability to communicate the actual impacts to both the scientific community, but also to the public. Um, and I think that benefits our film and I think it would benefit any work that you're intending on doing on, on, on drought and drought relief in the Southwest US, Northwest Mexico. Um, yeah, so that would be my perspective. And if, and if you want recommendations for people, I know plenty of folks studying the impacts of, of drought who are hopefully charismatic and interested in participating in those kind of things. Um, maybe Steve, you have some other perspective. Well, I, I, I think that's excellent advice, Chris. And the other thing I was going to say is, you know, this whole process of, of figuring out how you're going to tell your story. I mean, there's a real creative process there. How are you going to tell that story, you know, and how are you going to tell it in a way that that maybe, you know, works around some of these challenges of, of trying to communicate about a climate story and there's so many people now who are keen on communicating the climate story like so you have to watch a, I, I would i would say something to do would be to watch films carefully and make notes about things that you think wow that's that's a neat creative kind of approach or and and then come up with something really unusual and 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 unique you know in, in in the sense of 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 trying to tell us a, a climate story in a in a in a way that maybe hasn't been used before it's hard that's a challenge you know we we definitely agonized over that with this project a lot Yeah, um, thank you so much for that, Stephen. We are still looking forward to questions, but I'll jump in with one that I have. Um, and Chris, you've talked about a bit just about how your science has changed. And I was wondering if you could break that down a bit more, just what it's been like for you since you've been back from this expedition um, and how your work has 
changed since and just what you're thinking about in terms of your research um, and the Arctic in a larger sense? Sure. Yeah, so I think um, the major change that's happened, so previously to being on this expedition with, with Steve and co was, uh, it was always my idea that sea ice is inaccurately represented in, in climate models and the impacts of that are quite severe. Um, and I think experiencing that firsthand just reinforced this concept that we really need to build new models of, of polar climate. And, and that's part of what we're doing now. So my research group, which is split between here in New Zealand and in the US is part of a broader research effort called the Scale Aware Sea Ice Project to build basically a new style of modeling for polar regions to fix what models would say is happening in their strait. And actually a place that we don't talk about in the film, but is very poorly represented in our estimates of future climate, which is Antarctica. So both of these things are, both of these regions are highly impacted by sea ice. And one of the studies we followed up on, we worked in a community in West Greenland and found that there is strong changes to the way that sea ice is breaking up in fjords. And that is related to the structural properties of the ice and would never have been predicted in much the same way it was not predicted in the strait where we were in, in theirs. So I think this is mainly reinforced and helped really focus the efforts we do in my group uh, in terms of trying to understand sea ice as this really dynamic and, and fracturable material. Steve alluded to the fact that it's moving extremely rapidly. Like this is not a quiescent environment. The flow varies with the tides and it can go several meters per second. I mean, sea ice is a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. It will crush you to death if you lie between two pieces of flows. And actually Scott Simper, who is uh, one of the filmmakers on this project, um, was crushed by flows. And that's a pretty traumatic experience. So sorry for <laughs> he was there, but the, the um, yeah. I so there's quite a bit of different project, not this one. Amazing what people will go back to, honestly. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, trying to understand CS from this perspective has, has been, you know, a real refocusing and, and I, you know, I hope that's shared by the research, the members of my research group and the folks I collaborate with. Yeah, thank you for that. And it is, you know, just in case you'd like to add anything, it is a question that Michael from the audience has asked as well. Um, they're just asking what work is being done to correct the inaccurate climate models where sea ice is concerned, especially the underestimates in the last ice area. Sure. Yeah, so this is a big focus of our uh, a big project that's that's funding my group and about 100 scientists around the world. So that's I'm doing this as a PI in collaboration with a group in France and a group in Norway. And so we basically recognized they built this really sophisticated type of sea ice model and our group is working on aspects of that. So most of the people in my research group are funded or, or are working on trying to improve these models and making them a more accurate reflection of how, you know, what ice actually is, which is a solid fracturable material that causes our lives to be fairly miserable when we're up there. Um, but yeah, it's just fundamentally interesting physically. So. Yeah, hopefully we're we're doing better um, um, and not relying on these legacy models that are inaccurate and inaccurate in a time of rapid change. Yeah, and another question from Emily is, what are three books or podcasts or films that you guys would recommend for journalists who want to do a better job covering climate change and its impacts? Wow. Three books. Okay. Got a list, Steve. I'm I'm working on it. Um, I would say I would I would actually say that um an author that I've been enjoying a lot is Elizabeth Colbert and her her work on telling stories, actually kind of a literary version of this type of filmmaking in some ways, very much an experiential um first person um exploration she's she won a pulitzer prize for uh the book the sixth extinction which um is an incredibly powerful book and um and more recently a book called under a white sky which which in a way touches on 
the white t-shirt, uh, at least one of the chapters in, in that book touches on Diana's white t-shirt idea, you know, um, and what are we going to do with geoengineering, you know, another big uh, topic of conversation out there these days. Um, so that those would be a couple I could think of um, books wise. Chris? Yeah, I'd recommend a couple in sort of that same ballpark. So there's work that's been done by Naomi Oreskes, who is a sort of historian of science, maybe, or maybe a political scientist at, at Harvard in the Harvard Center for the Environment. So that's been a lot about how, um, how it is that the narrative around climate change is shifting um, or is being shifted by entrenched interests. And I think those are really good novels. Um, and she's, I think, and I was good friends with some of her former students and postdocs um, who often come under the target of a lot of ire from the suspects you might expect. Um, so I think Naomi's work is really foundational for understanding how we change the narrative on climate. I would also say that um, Bathsheba DeMuth is a colleague of mine at Brown, and she's written a number of both um, sort of scientific and semi-scientific, I would say like more storytelling novels about um, changes that are ongoing in mainly the Bering region, so the, the American and Russian Arctic, um, but about the relationship between people and the ice and how that's changing in time. And she's written just, a, I think, a recent novel. It's called Histories from History from the Dog Sled. So she just gave a talk to uh, the faculty at Brown about that. And I think she's a really interesting person to, to follow up on. She's done lots of similar things to this panels and discussion. She's a really interesting scientist or researcher. I can write the name in awesome. the chat, actually. Awesome, thank you for that. And there's one last question from Rafa, which is the Southern Ocean has experienced a large decrease in sea ice extent in the last years. Is there any planned effort to show that in a film or documentary? Or what's next for each of you? Show it Rafa. Rafa is a postdoc working in my group, in case anyone is curious about who that is, um, working on Southern Ocean Sea Ice. So Steve, do you want to send Rafa to the Southern Ocean? I think that'd be a great one. Um, yeah. I I have no doubt that there that there would be an amazing story in there and a very different story there. Uh, again, um, what what would that story look like? Um, what how how to make that compelling and and uh, you know just there's just a lot to think about there you know so and a big part of it would be to do a lot of research as, as a filmmaker if you're interested in these in in pursuing these ideas uh these themes um you start by talking with people like chris and his colleagues his in his network his postdocs and um and hearing people's stories and um doing as much reading as possible so i I will say that this project has been quite a long one, this last one, and um, it's not over when you finish a film like this one. We're still um, helping this film um, make its way in the world. So um, I'm still not actually thinking about taking on new projects right now, because we still have a big project where we're, we're pretty pretty involved in, and, and, that's, and that's this one. And, um, and I think it's still something we haven't really talked about is just this idea that that we have um, again this our Earth has only a few ways to cool itself down, and that ice covering the Arctic Ocean is one of the ways that you know this planet thermal regulates, so to speak, again without using the the appropriate scientific lingo. So. I think that's something that we still don't think about enough as a society is, okay, if we lose our sea ice in the Arctic, how how are we going to cool the earth? And um, the best solution would be not to lose the sea ice in the Arctic, wouldn't it? So anyway, that's my my thing is to still keep that conversation going. And it, it fits in with this whole idea of, of if we are going to make these 
you know, Paris targets. We're going to have to be thinking about our sea ice. We're going to have to be thinking about how 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 are we going to not lose all that ice in the Arctic Ocean? Because there's the other thing is that it's not like it's not like it's it's a, a foregone conclusion at this point in time. There are foregone conclusions, perhaps, but it's not it's not that any efforts made now won't have a powerful impact on the future. I'd add that the um, there was a planned expedition similar to our own that was to Antarctica that I was loosely, loosely involved in called Panama Peninsula. I don't think it actually went off. And one of the reasons for that is the conditions you'd require. Um, you know, we, we were lamenting earlier the fact that it's difficult to get around in the high Arctic. And that's true, but it's, boy, is it worse in the Southern Ocean. There's a few manned research stations and that's it. So there's no real place for for resupply. There's no real place to pull out because you've got the the uh, glacier mainly around most of the continent. So it's a, it's a challenging, a ch more challenging environment to film if you're going to do it in a sort of independent and unsupported way. That's right. But I'm open. If anyone, speaking of future things, if anyone on this call is interested in filming some more stuff, I'll go anywhere. <laughs> really, it's a great experience. And I would encourage people to, to consider ways of doing that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much to the both of you um, for being here today, for taking the time to answer questions, um, and for all the work that you're doing, uh, both with this documentary and beyond. Uh, it's been a real pleasure, and I'll hand it back to Steve from the Pulitzer Center. Thank you, Meral. Um, on behalf of the Pulitzer Center, I want to express uh, our deep gratitude to Meral Jamal. Professor Chris Horvat and filmmaker Stephen Smith uh, for this fascinating conversation. Thank you all for, for making time for this and, and for our audience. Um, uh, the Pulitzer Center will continue to spotlight um, vital Arctic issues through our support uh, for reporting and outreach. If you're a journalist with an Arctic reporting project in mind, please consider applying for a grant with us. And if you're an educator who wishes to bring Arctic issues into the classroom, please reach out to us via our website pulitzercenter.org. We also uh, very much appreciate all of you in the audience for joining us today. Thank you for making time. Uh, and for those of you who are able, please consider becoming a Pulitzer Center uh, champion to support our work. And finally, um, a survey will uh, follow the end of this webinar. We appreciate you taking uh, a few minutes of your time to share feedback, which will help us improve our, our future events. Um, thank you all for joining us again, and bye for now. Thank you very much, Steve, and the Pulitzer Center for your interest and in supporting our project with this uh, with this webinar. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks both. You've got it. Thank you both. Thank you. <laughs>